Now, I, I think that um, as I was sitting and listening to these, I thought that I would try to um, see if I could get each of you to give me an impression of, um, you know, what where surgeons, we gave really terrific talks on all these areas, very different areas, about what we can do, you know, why you would do them. And the patient will show up in our office, um, and that, that sense of when the, when the patient has come to me, that sort of defines that they need something done. But maybe that's not always the case. And, and taking aside the very significant deformities and sort of the subtle malunions that might or might not get fixed, are there, are, are in each of your areas um, that you talked about, are there some red flags about a patient that if it's something that could be done, uh, a red flag that would tell you clinically that, that I probably shouldn't do this, then maybe we can teach uh, to, to everyone. And, and Joe, it may be easiest to start with you because you touched on it already, pain versus um, functional issues. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously there, there's all kinds of red flags with the mechanism of injury, you know, if, if that when you ask them if you slipped on a lettuce leaf at home, would you be suing yourself just because the lettuce was at Gennardi's? That makes this a bigger deal. And uh, the, uh, the, the test of matching their complaint with whatever deformity they have. And I, I mean, I'll have them keep a diary. You know, it's painful when they come back because the, one the ones that do it sit there and go over it, with, over it with you chapter and verse. But you get information out of that that's beyond just, okay, this is what this looks like. And that, you know, that's, that's kind of a Zen thing to, to know, you know, outside of the, okay, they were a smoker and they got this and they got that. I can, I can really make them worse. And then speaking of that, that's always one of the opening lines in my conversation, you know, John Lockman taught us that his opening remarks to us were always that, you know, there's, there's no patient that you can't make worse by surgery. So make sure that they understand that too. All right, and that's the issue is I think that, that we can do all these really terrific things, spinal deformities, lower extremity deformities, and um, having the patient go through that, they're not really sure what they're getting into, and then the, the risks of the complications may outweigh the benefits of what they can get, especially in, in some of the more subtle deformities that we have. Susan, any, any thoughts? Um, I think that one of the things that works to our advantage maybe is the fact that these are complex procedures so they require, at least in my office, several visits leading up to the decision to actually do the surgery. You say, okay, hi, okay, I see, I see what you're going through. It looks really tough. Let's look into this a little bit. Let's get this CAT scan. Let's get this. And, and you bring them back each time to go over it and to discuss a little more and to discuss a little more because people can't take all that information that you're throwing at them, about, especially about something that's it's complex for us already. It's, a, it's unimaginable for them to be able to understand the implications of what they're asking you to do and what it would mean for them to go through it. So if you see them in your office multiple times before you leap into this surgery, you get to know them, they get to know you, everybody understands a little better, and maybe some of the warning signs declare themselves. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's critical too. I think you, you meet and you get to know these people if you're gonna be taking care of this stuff and it takes a long time. It's not a quick, you get it done, you have to get into their whole situation. Any thoughts? You gotta fix all the spine stuff, right? It just, you need to. <laughs> fix all the spine. Fix everybody. Um, now, you know, so I think the overall principles are pretty similar, whether it's a spine or a hand or deformity. The number one, you wanna try to establish if the problem really is the deformity, where the pain is coming from, and then how much it affects them. Though I, the, the thing that's different about spine is that you also have spinal, the uh, your neurological, elements involved. And so those are sometimes that would tilt you in the, f in the favor of maybe recommending surgery a bit more, um, uh, you know, strongly than others. But those are rare in terms of these, these um, chronic post-traumatic deformities. So most of the time patients will come with pain or worsening deformity, or they just don't like the way they look. You know, so in those cases, yes, you're not gonna offer surgery to everyone. Every now and then you get a patient who is myelopathic because the deformity is causing enough of a, um, uh, an angular problem that their spinal cord is really getting pinched over there. And so in those cases, yes, I think surgery is more indicated than not. Uh, but yes, uh, apart from neurological problems, uh, most of the time if it's more of a pain issue that's been going on, then yes, you do have many discussions with them. You see the pain is actually coming from the deformity and what their reason behind seeking that is. You have some young girls who come in, they don't like the way their hunched back looks, but apart from that, they're fine. 
Um, and then, you know, then there are some people who actually have real problems because they can't really stand up straight. So I think the key is really just like most problems to try to differentiate why they're seeking treatment and if the treatment we're going to offer them is going to help them or not. We have one case. It is a lower extremity case, Sakab. Uh, so mostly for Susan, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> uh, this is, uh, and it illustrates a little bit, you know, what you'll see. But this is a 44-year-old uh, man who had a motorcycle crash uh, and came in with uh, this injury uh, with his initial x-rays, but also with significant uh, comorbidities. He did have a head, in head injury and was intubated in the unit for a while. He did have a significant pelvic injury, including um, a, a bladder urethral injury, uh, and then ended up ultimately with a, a prolonged infection related to that. But this was his initial um, distal tibial shaft x-ray. It is extraarticular fibula as well. Uh, and he did get into the OR for a, a frame on it um, at some point, which had reasonable pull it out to length kind of issues with it. Susan, any comments? Did you say closed? Or closed. Closed. And no compartment issue? Or anything? No. Um, yeah, I, it's kind of, it's a little hard. I mean, obviously, you're going to want to get a CAT scan just to be sure. When they go really close like that, just just get a CAT scan just to be sure. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, sometimes you'll just miss a little thing, um, something around the back, like a small, minimally displaced or non-displaced posterior mal that can reflect more instability. Um, so... As will him, happen. They treat him in the frame? He stayed in the frame for a little while with the bladder and the infection and everything else going on. Uh, all we could do was take the frame off, and then he disappeared, and then he walked in um, like this at about six months. How's his skin look? It's fine. He's pretty thin. He had some um, nutritional. He was you know, mal malnourished to a little extent after his injury. He was a thin guy to start with. Um, an occasional smoker, but uh, um, otherwise healthy. He had essentially resolved the bladder infection issue at this point, although he is still uh, has a drainage tube. So I, I would definitely do an infection workup before I jumped into the operating room because he was probably bacteremic at some point in time during that, you know, initial injury, and, you know, it could have seeded and be just subtle enough that it's not making him sick. Um, so even though his skin doesn't look that bad, he doesn't really look infected on the outside, I'd get infection labs. And I would consider if there was any other, you know, if there was even the slightest suspicion of like, oh, what's this little divot right here? Or what's this? Is that some fluid on your sock? You know, like check out their socks. You know, these little things drain and Ne never an orthopedist is so suspicious as a trauma and infection specialist. That's true, yes. <laughs> and um, so I would, I would get that part of, of the workup completed just to make sure I felt okay about things. Yeah, and those all, those all felt fine. They were okay. Occasional smoker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, got he gets Lucy's on the street, Joe. <laughs> this is for the ride home. <laughs> so... It's a malunion talk, and, and uh, you showed some frames, you showed some plates. What would your approach to this be? His spine is okay, sorry. He's <laughs> <laughs> got a CT in anyway. <laughs> so, um, a Taylor spatial frame or something like it is, is, is a very powerful tool, but it requires a very compliant patient. It's very hard to manage. It's a lot of investment on the part of the surgeon, a lot of uh, follow-up and making sure that everything is going just right. And if you don't have a, a, a powerful team behind you for that and the patient is not super on top of things, it can be a bigger disaster than it's worth. So if this guy has already proven himself to be kind of poorly compliant, didn't really come in for follow-up, you know, kind of walked around on this other thing that was supposed to be temporary and never really showed up, then I would probably steer away from that, at least initially. Also, the, a, a frame, if you were to choose it, might need to go down into the foot for that distal of a fracture, and that's always that much more complex, too. So like I said, I'd kind of dabble in those things, but 
you know, the, the more problems that are piling up, the less likely I would be to turn to that. So um, it's pretty distal, and I don't think you get super great control with a nail. You know, you'd have to do a lot of extra stuff to make your nail maintain the reduction that you wanted after you did your osteotomies and stuff. So I'd probably plate it. And how about the fibula? Yeah, well, I can't, yeah. I, I think in order to get the ankle right, you're going to have to osteotomize both. And again, I would make sure that I had a CAT scan as part of my workup so I could not only, not only, uh, you know, to um, assess the degree of, of bony union um, or, or lack thereof, but also to just uh, look at that relationship, you know, in this, in Sejura, what do I need to do with that, if anything, and so forth. Yeah, and that's uh, all uh, what I was thinking about, and I, I've done spatial frames. They're a lot of work and uh, a question, and I think they're very powerful. Uh, I did not do for this guys, and not to uh, belabor it too much, I did do um, osteotomy, and I nailed him. Uh, and I had trouble with the distal fibula, and I think I uh, had to osteotomize through the old fracture as well, and then decided I had to fix that as well, but I got him lined up over nail uh, as I could, and soft tissues actually did did fairly well. I left his fibula up high unfixed because I want him to heal. And you know, he was, comes back to see me now and again, and he's healed. One of these close enoughs, I think. No, he looks good. He's probably happy, right? He is. Yeah. I think they got his bladder back together too, which made him happiest, <laughs> so. Very good. All right, thank you very much, panelists. Thank you.